Hey, Weed North, Mr. Yergler here. Let's talk about bonding. A lot of this is just going to be an intro into ionic and covalent bonding, differentiating between the two. Uh, a lot of it should be review. Let's think about what holds atoms together. Now, here's a picture of a water molecule or several water molecules. And you may remember from your first year of chemistry that there's hydrogen bonds in water. And if we heat water up to a really high temperature to the boiling point, uh, it, it begins to break those bonds and the water molecules separate, right? And it goes off as a gas. Now that is separating the bond, breaking the bond between the water molecules. I want to know what actually holds the atoms themselves together, which is a different question. I really want to narrow in on this oxygen-hydrogen bond, not the attraction force from one molecule to the other. So if we think about it, what really is holding the oxygen atom to the hydrogen atom? It's, it's got to be some sort of like duct tape, atomic duct tape that's holding this together, right? Inside the atom, there's really just a few different particles, the protons and electrons, and then there's also the neutrons, but they're not really playing a role in this. And so it's really simply physics, but there's so much physics going on that it's actually really complex. So we have repulsion forces occurring between two atoms that are next to each other, repulsion forces between their, their nuclei because they're both positive, but also between electrons because they're both negative. But there's also attraction forces. So there's the proton here is attracting its own electron, but it's also attracting the electrons from the other atom. And so when two atoms form a chemical bond, they're actually reaching an equilibrium or, or a stable mixture of these two forces. So they're, they're close enough that they're attracted, but they're not so close that they're repelling each other. We can actually look at a graph that kind of shows this. So here we have two hydrogen atoms, each with their own one electron. And they're completely separate, right? So they're not forming a bond. We just have the, the individual H atoms. Now these aren't really that stable, again, because they just have the one electron. As we bring them closer, notice what's happening on my graph. This is potential energy. And the stable, remember that the stable configuration is when the potential energy is the lowest, the most negative. As we bring these together, watch what happens to the electrons. They actually switch from just oscillating around their own nuclei to actually being attracted to each other uh, right there. And they're held now between the two nuclei. And, and you'll notice too, when I pull these apart, they go back together, but then they reach like this, this equilibrium point. If I force them together, look what happens to the potential energy. It, it increases. And there's that repulsion force between the nuclei of the two, of the two atoms. If I let them go, they, they again reach their, their stable configuration. And this is the, the, what's called the bond length. The potential energy difference is related to their st that stability. So the more stable the molecule, the deeper this dip will be on the, on the graph. Here's another picture that kind of shows this. When they reach this maximum mixture of, uh, of repulsion and attraction, they're at their most stable state, and that's at the lowest potential energy. So it's going to require some sort of energy input, the activation energy, in order to separate those two and go back to the individual atoms. All of this is driven largely by electronegativity. The electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. So if you think about, about that example I just showed, it's really the, the force from the nucleus to the other atom's electron, because we're talking about a bonding pair, not just its own electron. It's driven by all of the, the periodic trends that we've talked about. Nuclear charge, shielding, Coulomb's law, and the atomic radius. So if we look at our periodic table, if you, as you go across, our atomic radius is getting smaller because our nu nuclear charge is increasing. All of these trends are also related to each other. As our atom gets smaller, the, the force from the inside to the outside gets stronger because of Coulomb's law, which states that the closer these two particles get to each other, the stronger the force between them. So fluorine is actually our most electronegative element. Uh, we want to ignore the noble gases because they're not really going to pull on anyone's electrons. We have two different categories of bonds, covalent and ionic, and it's kind of a, a broad spectrum between the two. We kind of create individual uh, categories. What's really going on is a compound will have a lot of covalent character, we could say, or it might have a lot of ionic character. But keep in mind that this is really just a spectrum. Let's talk first about nonpolar covalent. This is where we have basically equal sharing of electrons. So each atom is pulling on the, on the bonding electrons just as much as the other one. We're going to say that if the difference between electronegativities between the two elements is less than 0.5, then it's going to be nonpolar covalent. Again, this is kind of an arbitrary cutoff point. 
If it's 0.4, then that's even more nonpolar. For our purposes, we're going to focus on just knowing and understanding that, that the electronegativity is what's driving this polarity of these bonds. In a covalent bond, whether it's polar or nonpolar, we're sharing electrons. And so carbon contributes four electrons of its own. Hydrogen only has one. But if you pair carbon up with four hydrogens, now carbon is sharing a total of eight electrons, which fills its, its octet rule fills its out, outer valence shell, and hydrogen has now filled its 1s shell as well because it, each one is sharing two electrons. So they've gained stability, they've, they've lowered their potential energy by forming this bond. And if you look at carbon versus hydrogen's electronegativities, carbon is 2.5, hydrogen is 2.1, the difference is about 0.4, and so this is slightly, slightly polar, but essentially it's a nonpolar bond. Now let's look at polar covalent. So we're sliding over on the, on the bonding spectrum. Now we're, we're still dealing with sharing of electrons, but unequal sharing. And we're going to make our cutoff points somewhere between 0.5 and 1.7. So if we look at water, for example, water is made of oxygen and hydrogen, 3.5 versus 2.1. That difference there is 1.4, and so it's an, it's an unequal sharing of electrons. It's a polar covalent bond. This is often represented with what's called a dipole moment arrow. We're pointing to the atom that has the higher electronegativity, indicating that the electrons are going to be hanging out with the chlorine more than the hydrogen because the chlorine is pulling on them more strongly than the hydrogen is. We can also use partial negative and partial positive signs in order to indicate this side of the molecule is slightly positive because the electrons are pulled more to the other side. This picture is showing the electron density in a water molecule. There's a higher probability that the electrons will be around the oxygen or near the oxygen than the hydrogen. And so we have a slightly negative side of the molecule and a slightly positive side of the molecule. Now we're sliding even further over on our spectrum. Our difference in electronegativity is even greater and it, we're involving the complete transfer of electrons. So the nonmetal is so electronegative it completely pulls the metal's electron away. In ionic bonds, we're always going to be dealing with a metal bonded with a nonmetal. So that's a good rule of thumb. Sometimes your electronegativity difference will be kind of hovering around 1.7. If it's a metal and a nonmetal, it's going to be ionic. Let's look at sodium and chlorine. Sodium chloride is a great example of ionic bond. Sodium's electronegativity is 0.9, chlorine is 3.0, and so the difference is greater than 1.7. Now, if we look at sodium and chlorine and look at their electron configurations, sodium has that, that 1, 3s electron, and chlorine has, is one away from a full outer shell. Chlorine is very electronegative, and so it just will just take sodium's electron completely, forming noble gas electron configurations for both atoms, which is far more stable than they were before. Now what's holding them together is not the sharing of electrons, but just the, the electrostatic attraction between the two charged particles. This is driven by Coulomb's law, as we've seen before. So the stronger this negative is, or the stronger the positive is, the stronger the force between them. Because of the differences in the bonding, there's also differences in properties. The covalent molecules have really low melting points, low boiling points, because the molecules aren't holding on to each other as, as closely. They're poor conductors of electricity, and they tend to be gases or liquids, sometimes solids, at room temperature. As opposed to ionic compounds, which have really high melting points and, and really high boiling points, they're great conductors of electricity, uh, not in the solid state, but in, uh, in aqueous phases or in the liquid phase. And they're crystalline solids at room temperature. They form, a, they form what's called a lattice structure. And here's a picture of that lattice structure. When you have sodium chloride, you just have positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, over and over again, over again in this crystalline structure. Now, we're going to talk about this more in the future, but based on Coulomb's law, the closer these two, par these two charged particles can get to each other, the stronger the force between them. And that's called the lattice energy. So if you look at sodium chloride, sodium is a relatively small ion in comparison to chloride, which has electrons in three energy levels. If you compare that to fluorine, which only has electrons in two energy levels, fluorine is a much smaller atom than chlorine. And so because this ion is smaller, this lattice structure is actually tighter and the ions are closer to each other. And so it re requires a greater amount of energy to break them, and that's called the lattice energy. We'll get into that more in the next couple of videos. The emphasis here is just being able to identify covalent and ionic compounds based on what elements you're talking about and understand the, prop the property differences between the two. If you have any questions on that stuff, be sure to write those down and bring them up in class. All right, this is Mr. Yergler signing out.